Our speaker tonight is Dr. Shirley Blanc. Dr. Blanc graduated from the University of Waterloo School of Optometry in 2001. She focuses a significant portion of her practice on assessing and treating patients with visual-based problems from traumatic brain injury. Dr. Blanc is a fellow of the Neuro-Optometric Rehabilitation Association, an international multidisciplinary organization. Her literature review article about visual dysfunction from whiplash injury was published in Optometry and Visual Performance in December 2019. She is a co-investigator at the University of Toronto with the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education and their Sport Medicine Clinic, looking at the influence of peripheral visual motor abilities on sport injury risk. She has provided services in vision rehabilitation as well as vision performance for athletes at all levels, including varsity, Olympic, and pro. Welcome, Dr. Blum. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be doing this. Um, I know it's a, a strange time for everyone, a strange time for Ontario optometrists, certainly. So I really appreciate all of you taking the time and listening to this. I'm hoping that this talk will appeal to both those ODs who wish to enter into the specialty of vision rehabilitation, but also for those ODs who just want to know um, a bit more about concussion and how it applies um, to their primary care practice and what to sort of look for in these patients. So here we go. So the slide just uh, you know shows that I have no financial um, conflicts of interest or disclosures. So I wanted to start out. Um, I want to start out with the definition of traumatic brain injury or concussion, and this is from the CDC. It's a disruption in the normal function of the brain that can be caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head or penetrating head injury. Most TBIs that occur each year are mild, commonly called concussions. And it's very important to note that many visual dysfunctions from a concussion are often not seen on traditional MRI or CT scans just because of the stretching and shearing forces of the axons, um, all these metabolic changes, biochemical changes, inflammatory reactions. Um, so often these patients will say, my scans were completely normal. I can't, there's no structural um, damage seen. So here's some facts about concussion. Um, the first fact is from the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation website. 150,000 Ontarians experience a concussion each year. Next point, which is really fascinating, females are more likely than males to get a concussion in sports such as soccer, basketball, baseball, softball, and ice hockey. There is such a hot topic now in concussion research about females and concussions. So, you know, the thought is perhaps females are more susceptible to a concussion because their neck musculature, are, it might be weaker, maybe not as able to brace for the impact, um, and the shakeup of the brain is greater as a result. So that's uh, one sort of thought or theory as to why this might be the case. And more on that in a moment. And approximately 85% recover after seven to, to 10 days. However, recovery has been shown to be longer if there's a history of ADHD, anxiety, depression, or learning disability, if, there, if the injury occurs during the luteal phase for females, so if a female gets a concussion about two weeks before her period, that's when the progesterone levels are at its highest, and then you get a sudden drop in progesterone after the injury, that can cause a, you know, many more sort of symptoms, more severe symptoms, and longer recovery. So it's not uncommon nowadays to ask a female, you know, when, you know, what part of the cycle did you actually get your concussion? Um, and studies have shown that females who are taking the birth control pill where their hormones are sort of more at a level uh, playing around throughout the whole cycle, they're not as susceptible to the severity um, of the symptoms and uh, they recover faster. So just an interesting kind of take on this. Um, you have a longer recovery if there's a prior history of concussion, pre-injury history of migraines. This was just presented at the American Headache Society um, annual meeting. Um, where migraine is a risk factor for um, recovery time. And if there's a delay in treatment, then recovery is longer as well. So this is an interesting study um, published in 2018 showing 
the risk of concussion in various sports and it's stratified according to different things like gender, um, adults versus youth, and gameplay versus practice. And the numbers that you see in front of you are basically the number of concussions per 1,000 athletic events. One athletic event equals one concussion or uh, one athlete playing in either a game or practice. So I want to point out a few things with the highlights here that I, I, uh, I did here. So in the blue highlight, you'll see that women are more likely to get a concussion from ice hockey than men. So it sort of goes along the whole female getting um, you know, higher risk of concussion than males. Um, and in the, in the green highlight, it, this also occurs in soccer. Um, going now to the youth sports, I highlighted soccer because in 2017, there was a study that showed that female youths are more likely to close their eyes intermittently um, as they're heading a ball. And so the thought is that, you know, maybe if they're, they're shutting out visual information, can that put these females more at risk for concussion because of that temporary closure of their eyes during the heading? So it was just a very interesting study, things to think about. Um, and also gameplay versus practice, you're way more likely to get a concussion during a game than in practice. And, you know, when you think about it and when you're playing a game, uh, sort of a team sport, there's a lot more stress involved. There's a lot more potential for threats um, to come at you. And, you know, what stress can do ultimately, and it's been shown in the literature, is stress can actually tunnel your vision. So your peripheral awareness can shrink because of, of stress. And if your peripheral awareness is shrinking, then potentially, you know, I would hypothesize that your risk of concussion would increase. More on that later on in the lecture. But that's just an interesting relationship as well. So normally in a sort of live setting, I would do a true or false um, sort of slide where everyone would shout out the answers, but we'll just do it here and you can just think about it silently. So first question, the degree and type of visual dysfunction from a concussion depends on where the head was hit, true or false? And the answer is false. You cannot predict what visual dysfunction will occur depending on where the head was hit. The shakeup of the brain disrupts so many different complex pathways and you'll see that vision is really encompassing most of the brain. So you really can't predict the exact visual problems someone will have depending on where the head was hit. Next. Concussion can only occur when there is direct impact to the head, true or false. Many people think this is true, but actually it's false. You can get a full-on concussion with a whiplash injury without direct hit to the head. And, um, you know, it's the shakeup of the brain from that whiplash injury that can produce these same effects that is essentially a concussion. So this is an important factor uh, to note. And number three, the best, the best practice for acute concussion is to lie in a dark, quiet room for two weeks or until symptoms completely resolve. False. I'm not even going to pause on that. So when I was growing up, that was the standard of practice, the standard of care. You lie in a dark, quiet room for two weeks. But it's been shown that, A, it can be very detrimental to mental health. I mean, throw a teenager in a dark, quiet room for two weeks after a concussion away from their friends, away from their devices. And I mean, that can really um, do a number on their sort of mental state, certainly. Um, but also healing has been shown to be um, delayed um, with this practice. So the International Consensus Statement for Sport-Related Concussion, which is published every four years, the next one is coming out next year, and it's really headed by a multidisciplinary uh, panel of, you know, global experts. They stated in this uh, sort of Bible that they produce that the the, pra the best practice now is to lie in a sort of dark, dark quiet room for maybe 24 to 48 hours max and then you start to introduce light exercise sort of sub-symptom threshold um, cardio exercise to get the brain back online and you know non-cognitive activities just things to sort of help the brain function again um, and exercise has been really a, a game changer um, with recovery from concussion. So um, in vision therapy circles, when we give lectures and, you know, we often say vision is much more than the ability to see 2020 on a letter chart, because that's often uh, what the general public sort of views vision as. And um, from our, you know, as an OD audience, you know, I like to say that the visual process is not as simple as, you know, the sort of single solitary pathway light, you know, entering the eye, um, converting signals to the optic nerve and making a beeline to the visual cortex at the back of the brain. I show this next slide every single time I talk because it's just mind blowing to me. So the visual system is such a complex array of interconnecting, integrative pathways that encompass most of the brain, if not all the brain. 
and I'm not going to go through all the slide. It's in. It's going to be in the in the notes that you get. But essentially, you know, to do a simple eye movement like a saccade, which is you know looking from point A to point B. I mean, you need your parietal lobe to have that spatial kind of perception. You need your frontal lobe to make the eye movement. Like there's so many parts of the brain that need to be accessed for a simple eye movement. So I mean, to be honest, it's not surprising that um, a shakeup in the brain will affect vision often, you know, in one way or another. So this is probably one of the top two slides uh, as far as importance in this lecture. So I explain the vision system as a bimodal process. So first we have our central vision. This is our uh, visual acuity. This is our high resolution vision. Um, and this is our conscious vision. Like we're looking at something, we're aware of what we're seeing. And it's, it's also called the parvocellular process. Um, and you'll find, you'll see that it is a slower process, it's sort of our classic what we're seeing. Then there's our peripheral process. And there are different ways of looking at our peripheral vision. So we have to talk about peripheral range versus peripheral awareness. So peripheral range is basically the available peripheral vision range structurally that we have available to us. So in a healthy individual, you know, you'll have um, uh, like 200, degrees horizontally and 70 uh, superiorly and 80 inferiorly. And that's sort of what we have available to us. But peripheral awareness is the um, amount of that visual field that you'll tap into. And so that's a functional phenomenon. And you can have uh, patients, you can have kids, you can have um, uh, people after concussion, which I'll mention in a second, where you can have a peripheral field of like five degrees, but then it expands back to its normal field with you know proper training and therapy and all that. So peripheral awareness is a very different, different phenomenon than peripheral range. Our peripheral vision is also our motion processing system. It detects flicker. Um, we'll talk about that after as well. And I didn't write this down in the slide, but 20% of our ganglion cells carry this peripheral vision information and it it happens really quickly before we're aware of what we're seeing. So 20% of this uh, you know, ganglion cell population carries visual information, goes right to the midbrain. So not to our occipital cortex, but right to a subconscious area of our brain that quickly interacts with other systems in our body, like our vestibular system, our, which is our sort of inner ear leveling orientation system, and our body's position, um, our body's sense of where it is in space, that's called proprioception. All these systems come together fast and say, okay, where are we? What's our threat? What's happening around us? Where do we move? What's going on? And, and so this, um, this peripheral processing happens very fast. And then we're sort of aware of what we're seeing afterwards. So um, normally, um, you should be able to use your central vision and your peripheral vision, your peripheral processing at the same time. So for example, you should be able to text on your phone and navigate expertly through a crowd around obstacles and not realizing you're doing that. You should be able to do both at the same time. And you know, I also give the example of you know driving from point A to point B, and you're thinking about your grocery list or whatnot, and then you get to point B, and you're like, I don't even remember driving. Like, I don't remember the route. Like, I I just I don't remember driving there. And that's our peripheral processing, our sort of automatic subconscious, auto, you know, um, kind of uh, processing system that happens without our awareness. So that's that's important to highlight. So the problem with the concussion is that you know utilizing both central and peripheral processing is a multitask and it's very hard for their brains. So often these patients will have, you know, their best corrected VA intact. So they'll come to your office and they're still seeing their best corrected vision, you know, 2020 um, or whatnot. But they might not know where they are in space. They might not be able to process, um, you know, motion around them. It might sort of freak them out. Often they'll say things come at me from the side. I wasn't aware of it at all. Um, so they really can't do both. And so effectively, these patients are very tunneled. The, their peripheral awareness shrinks. They're, they have the small island of functional vision that they're looking through, and this can be very disorienting. This small study sort of highlights this phenomenon of that disconnect between central and peripheral processing in, in concussed patients. Uh, 23 post-concussion patients with new visual dysfunctions were compared with 30 healthy controls with no history of concussion, and they used um, an instrument called the DynaVision, which is a, a very large board, for those who don't know, where you sort of whack lights, almost like whack-a-mole. Um, and um, they compared central reaction time to peripheral reaction time. So central reaction time is where you look at a light and you react to it centrally. 
peripheral reaction time is you react to it, a light presented peripherally. And what wasn't surprising was that the central and peripheral reaction times um, were slower in the post-concussion group, but the fascinating thing was that the difference between central and peripheral reaction times was twice as great in the post-concussion group than in the uh, controls. So again, that disconnect between central and peripheral processing is highlighted here. So remember when I said 20% of our ganglion cells um, go right to um, this sort of subconscious area of the brain as a fast process. So this area of the midbrain um, I call the boardroom. I'm going to mention the boardroom and this is what I'm talking about. I can actually do a whole lecture on this one slide. This is the, the second of the most important slides of this lecture, but I think they're all important. So in the midbrain, I consider it like a boardroom where all these department heads, all these sensory systems come together, speak to each other, and send information back to their departments. Now, for um, you know, for a, a, a person to function normally and in a healthy way, information brought to the table by each department should be accurate. The departments should be able to speak to each other accurately and, and with good communication, and then accurate information going back to their respective departments. However, after a concussion, often there's um, a boardroom problem. So either information coming to the table is just not right, or the communication between the departments is not right, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So for example, information coming to the table that's not right. So say the autonomic system comes to the table and says, okay guys, everyone panic. And you know, often post-concussion patients have, um, their, their system is in fight or flight. They're in sympathetic overdrive. So autonomic comes to the table, says, okay, we're in sympathetic mode and vision and other senses are like, oh, got it, okay. So they take this as gospel and then vision will start to be like, okay, I'm gonna dilate my pupils, my accommodation will be thrown off, I'm gonna be more sensitive to light as a result. Auditory, the filter for sound, um, um, for sounds will be off, so it's like a radio dial that's not quite working. So you'll get a whole bunch of symptoms because the autonomic system came to the table to tell everyone to panic. Um, an example of two departments not getting along together um, is vision and vestibular. So if what you're seeing is in conflict with what your inner ear and your head position is telling you, then these are the motion sick patients. These are the dizzy nauseous, really miserable patients. I mean, they're debilitated. It's a very difficult thing to sort of live with. And, um, and that's a huge conflict there that has to be resolved. Vision can also come to the table with erroneous information. So vision might come to the table saying, you know guys, instead of walking on a straight floor, the floor is actually tilted down to the left. And proprioception, the body sense of where it is in space would be like, oh, okay, so I believe you vision. So I'm gonna start to lean to one side and distort my posture because we're walking on a sloped floor after all. And even though, um, uh, you know, you know, proprioception is doing the right thing by responding to vision, but vision's bringing the wrong information. So this boardroom is the key to everything. And this is often the thing that's disrupted after a concussion. So symptoms of post-trauma vision syndrome, and you know, I've listed a whole uh, bunch of symptoms. Many of them, uh, well, actually, you know, there are those symptoms that are not necessarily vision um, vision centric, but vision is is involved in all of these. So dizziness, for example, can be from the neck, but certainly vision is a part of dizziness. Um, balance problems, motion sensitivity, light sensitivity blurry vision with head movement or without head movement. That means there's no gaze stabilization. If you're, uh, if you're going blurry when your head is moving, then your gaze isn't stable. Double vision, peripheral vision problems. Remember that peripheral tunneling that happens. Um, headaches, depth perception issues, discomfort with reading. Remember, if you're tunneled, and I, I can't see myself, but I'm assuming you can see me do this. So if you actually tunnel your vision and try to look around the room, it's very disorienting. I mean, you're getting snapshots. Um, imagine you're in a grocery store and you're getting these snapshots, um, but not getting that full kind of grounded image, like having snowflakes come at you through a windshield with your high beams on. It, these people cannot sort of sense the whole area at the same time. It's very confusing. Um, and if you try to read with your vision tunnel, then you're reading one word at a time, essentially. You don't have that flow of the reading process. And you're obviously going to be disoriented on a page because you don't know where you are through this narrow field. And so reading is a huge, huge symptom. Intolerance to computer screens, so brightness on the screen or scrolling, the motion uh, really bothers them. Uh, dry eye symptoms are very common, so it's important to probe for that. 
discomfort with busy environments or patterns, reduced sense of where body is in space, reduced confidence navigating, difficulty with visual memory, like remembering what they saw, the higher sort of cognitive visual function as well. So the study shows some common um, visual manifestations after a uh, brain injury. Um, this sample is a visually symptomatic sample uh, two to four years after injury. And commonly you'll see things like accommodation problems and eye movement problems and convergence and sufficiency we're gonna get into. Um, strabismus at near and cranial nerve palsy, it can happen after um, a brain injury certainly, but I find, or a traumatic brain injury, but I find it's more common after a stroke. Um, I don't see it as often. It's really the top three that are huge um, in, the in my practice. Um, often I'll tell people, listen, you know, you have about a 50% chance of getting a convergence problem after a concussion versus say like a 10% chance um, in the general population. So we'll talk about CI. So let's talk about eye movements first. So this um, systematic review and meta-analysis um, went through different kinds of eye movements and compared um, mild versus severe traumatic brain injury versus um, healthy controls. And they looked at different kinds of my eye movements. Now, because you can see me, I can't see myself, but you can see me. Um, I'm going to go through these briefly. So they went through, uh, they studied reflexive saccades. So basically, you know, a light comes on and your eyes just go to the light. They looked at self-guided saccades where two lights come on and your eyes just go back and forth between the two lights on at, you know, as quick as you can. Memory guided saccades, a light comes on then goes off and you have to saccade to where you think the light was. Anti-saccades, which is a fascinating one, a light will come on and you have to quickly look the other way. So your brain really wants to look at the light, but your frontal lobe has to make that executive decision very quickly to say, nope, let's look in the opposite direction. So there's a lot neurologically going on with an anti-saccade and smooth pursuits as well. The results of the study showed, uh, or this review showed most, the most significant difference between the non-TBI and mild or severe TBI were the anti-saccades, not surprising, and memory-guided saccades. So what that led me to believe is that the study suggests the importance of higher cognitive function. There's sort of a lot of neurological um, sort of real estate that's required that affects eye movement after a concussion, like working memory, response inhibition, attention factors, visual spatial processing. So um, this is another topic in research, you know, how is uh, cognition um, sort of uh, related to eye movements, um, like attention, that kind of thing. Now let's talk about CI. When I first entered into the specialty about six years ago, five years ago, um, you know, I noticed that there were a few studies that showed that CI, they related CI to what seemingly was random sort of manifestations of a concussion. Like what was the relationship? That was my question. So this study, for example, showed that um, 78 athletes seen acutely after a sport related concussion who had um, CI and they, they actually labeled CI as an NPC less than or equal to five centimeters. That was their criteria. Um, those with CI performed worse on verbal memory, visual motor speed, reaction time, and had greater symptom scores. I was like, I mean, that's fine, but like, why? That was my question. And this study showed that um, in these 270 athletes with diagnosis of a concussion, again, um, criteria for CI was NPC greater than six centimeters. And there's no baseline, by the way, measured in these um, athletes. Those with CI took 50 or, or took longer to recover than those with no CI. So you know, convergence and sufficiency is apparently related to worse neurocognitive function, um, slower processing speed, slower reaction speed, uh, longer recovery. And I was like, I need to know why, where's, where's this connection? Why are they like talking about CI with all this stuff? And then the next study, you know, sort of made me think a bit more about this. Now, this is a, a pretty busy study uh, or pretty, pretty busy slide. So I'm just going to go through the summary of the study. It basically um, compared gait patterns, so walking patterns between, um, and they did a dual task, so walking with sort of a thinking problem solving task and just a regular walking task. And they looked at um, controls, healthy controls with no convergence problem. They looked at post concussion um, subjects with a convergence, with convergence insufficiency, and they looked at uh, post concussion subjects with um, no convergence problem. And um, you know, what was interesting with the site, well, first of all, it's not surprising that all subjects performed worse with the dual task versus the single walking task. I mean, multitasking is hard for everyone, fine. But the interesting take home with the study was that those with a concussion with CI 
had the most significant gait deficits compared to controls and also compared to uh, concussed patients with uh, no CI. So it was those with the CI that had this walking deficit. And then I started thinking, what causes us to converge? Where does convergence occur in the brain? Convergence happens because of that boardroom. So the boardroom in real life is called the superior colliculus of the midbrain. And when you sever the superior colliculus in animal studies, convergence is completely gone. So you need that boardroom, a functioning boardroom with all systems ago to be able to know how to converge. Like if you know where you are in space, then you're gonna know where to point your eyes in space at something relative to you, if that makes sense. So the calculation will be easier because you have a sense of where you are, where your head is. So, you know, this is where the connection kind of um, clicked into me. If there's a convergence problem after a concussion, it's not surprising to me because the boardroom isn't working that there would be other manifestations because that boardroom is not working, including motor output, gait deficits, neurocognitive, reaction speed, a whole bunch of stuff. So um, it's not really the convergence problem that's causing this, but it's sort of the convergence problem is a symptom of this greater neurological problem in that boardroom. And that's what I got from this. And remember in that boardroom, there's a sense called proprioception. Again, that's our sense of our joints and position or joints and muscles position in space. So if I close my eyes and I raise my right arm, then I know I'm raising my, my right arm because of the sense of like where my, you know, the tension of my shoulder and sort of where my arm is. I can, I can sense what my arm is doing. That's proprioception. So this study highlights the need of proprioception for convergence. So this is not a concussion study. This is basically a study showing those with idiopathic neck pain have poor convergence when their head is turned. So their NPC is worse when their head is turned. Why? When your head is turned, then proprioception, which is strong in your neck, by the way, you have really powerful proprioceptors in your neck. Um, you know, proprioceptors are sort of misfiring and confused because of the idiopathic neck pain. So then the person's like, okay, I don't know where my head is. I'm not sure what to do with my eyes then. And so it showed here a remote convergence um, with head turn. So again, this shows the importance of the neck for convergence. And I've had patients who've had neck treatment alone without an ounce of vision therapy and their NPC improves because now their neck is sort of back to this regular state where they know where their head is and they know what to do with their eyes. So again, boardroom is key. So primary care testing during the standard exam, um, you know, things that you can do with um, a, you know, a patient initially who's concussed, concussed who you see um, as sort of a first line of um, defense or uh, you know, as a first person who, you, who might see them after their GP. Um, you know, near point of convergence, uh, do NPC three times, you might see a fatigue in that. So you can see like five centimeters, then 10 centimeters, then 20 centimeters, and um, check for recovery. So if their endpoint is to the nose, they see double, but say, okay, when does it go back to single? And it takes them until arm's length to get them to single. That says something about their convergence effort. Um, DFE, um, there, there is evidence that there's retinal, potential retinal thinning, nerve fiber layer thinning, um, in conjunction with white matter um, cortical thinning um, in, um, you know, potentially in, in patients. So it's good to sort of monitor with OCT because um, it's sort of a direct um, view of the brain, really. Um, dry eye evaluation, looking at eye movements, so observations, um, commercially available device, devices such as King DVIC or developmental eye movement tests can uh, look at saccades. Um, accommodation, amplitude is important. Um, Round out stereo, qualitative and quantitative. This is a tip that I learned from a VT um, lecture where you're not looking at just like what circle pops up, but like how fast does it happen? So, um, so 120, so and 120 2 versus 24 2. Basically, um, I prefer 120 2 just to sort of see how far out in the periphery that I can test them. Um, you want to, uh, check for subtle vertical heterophoria and head tilt, and pupils, you want to check for bilateral rebound dilation. So we're not talking about an RAPD, but we're talking about you know, a direct light response and getting that initial constriction, but look for that rebound dilation. So after like one and a half seconds, if they start to rebound and dilate in both eyes, um, like doing it in each eye, then you know that their autonomic system is off and they're in the sympathetic mode because they just can't hold the constriction. 
neurooptometric assessment goes deeper, um, binocular evaluation, um, you know, BV, uh, oculomotor evaluation. We look at the boardroom. So how are the system, like different systems interacting with vision? Um, we look at facility testing, vergence and accommodation, because we're looking at stress, how they handle visual stress, um, how, how they're handling space around them, like how they're um, perceiving space. We look at gait patterns, um, visual motion tolerance, visual perception, like you know, visual memory, finding details within a complex background, um, and pupil evaluation. So these are performance measurements versus test measurements. Does the system fatigue easily? Do symptoms increase with tests? Often I'll see a patient with seemingly beautiful, smooth pursuits, um, and I perform the standing when I can, but then I'll start to see them swaying their body as I do a smooth pursuit test, or they're like, I feel dizzy and nauseous from doing that. So the smooth pursuit itself looked fine, but you have to look at these other details, what they're saying to you and what their body might be doing. That's just as important as the objective in my mind. Primary care considerations during the standard eye exam, things they don't teach you in school, as they say, um, lighting in the exam room. I keep things um, relatively dim in my exam room when a patient walks in and I actually tell them, I say, listen, you know, in case you're light sensitive, I'm going to keep it dim. But if you're not light sensitive, I can turn it back up. But I just keep it by default um, just in case. And they, they thank you immediately for it. So I either turn it back up or I leave it like that. But just that first impression of you caring for what they might be experiencing is gold. Music in the office. Um, the office that I'm in in Toronto, it's pretty, you know, it's young and hip. Um, but the staff know on a concussion day to keep the music down because these patients are not only light sensitive, they're also sound sensitive as well. Um, if you have fast talking staff in the office, um, it's just good to sort of remind them to maybe talk a little slower to the patient because their processing speed is slower. Um, waiting area, you don't want to have a patient waiting in a busy, bright, hustle bustle kind of dispensary area. You, you want to offer them a quieter, darker area and patients will often not like ask you for it. So you'll see that they're suffering in the, in the waiting room. So you have to, you know, it's nice to sort of offer them that and they, they just thank, they thank you for it. Busy visual patterns, so um, you know, wearing really busy uh, pattern clothing can make a patient feel like they want to throw up. So stripes or busy, you know, floor patterns. I mean, these things can really be bothersome. Even a heart chart um, can be very visually stimulating. So um, I wear solid clothing whenever I have a concussion day. Touching walls when they're walking. So if a patient's walking in the office and they're touching walls and touching the chair before they sit. Um, and it's similar to kids, by the way, when you have kids in your office and you know the ones where they're just touching your retina scope, they're touching this, they're touching this, they're touching this. Um, you know, it might be certainly an attention issue, but in fact, it's usually their visual system cannot be trusted. They don't trust their visual system to explore their world. So they have to use another sense, the tactile sense to explore the world. So these are sort of little hints that if they're touching their walls, touching the chair while they're walking, a little unsteady, they really don't trust what their vision is telling them. Medication factors, hard to suss out sometimes, but medication can be a cause of symptoms and not the concussion itself. So keep in mind any dosage changes, new medications, um, that kind of thing. So, Optometric treatment strategies, um, dry eye treatment, optical factors, we'll go through that, lenses, prisms, tint, selective occlusion, vision rehab, and star, 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 coordination with other rehabilitation professionals. Number four has been my bread and butter because of the boardroom. I'm going to go back to that. So other professionals that I've collaborated with very well um, and that have helped me kind of regain the patient's visual system, you know, people like physiotherapists, chiropractors, OTs, speech language therapy, um, audiologists, um, sports medicine uh, physicians, um, ENT, um, naturopath or registered dietitian, you know, what you eat can be inflammatory. Um, if your gut is inflamed, then your brain can be inflamed. So um, I have a naturopath colleague who I refer everyone to. He's amazing. He's a specialist in concussion. And um, really, if you have an inflamed brain, I can do all the vision therapy in the world, but it's just not going to necessarily help. And there's like massage therapists, osteopaths, neuropsychologists. So there's a whole village of care with these patients. It's not just about vision. So I'm going to talk about yoke prisms. Um, this has been probably one of the most powerful tools in the toolbox. It does not work for everyone. Um, you know, some patients with a, a, concuss, a concussion will have a distorted visual sense. I mentioned this before, and this is called a visual midline shift. The picture on the left is, um, uh, it's called the Gravity Room, and it's in the Children's Museum in Pittsburgh. And it just really beautifully shows what a person with a visual midline shift might see 
in their brain. They actually consciously don't necessarily see the room like this, but their brain perceives the room like this. So imagine they're walking, their brain thinks the room is exactly as shown, and they're going to contort their body to try not to fall. So when I'm watching a gait pattern, you know, I can tell how they're viewing the room. And um, it takes a lot of training to sort of figure this out and to quantify it and whatnot, but that's what a visual midline shift is. So yoke prism, what we can do, and a yoke prism, for those who don't know, is a prism pa placed on each eye with the base on this uh, at the same uh, side. So you can have base left OU, base right OU, base up OU, base down OU. And really what these yoke prisms do is we can, um, sort of change visual space in three dimensions. So I can, you know, we can actually like untilt the floor, tilt it up, tilt it down. I can make a wall go closer, further. So I can rearrange space in a three dimensional way. So if you look at the cube on the right and you think of the X, Y, and Z axes, you know, if the cube is rotated on the X axis, then you'll have one edge coming towards you and then one edge away from you and you can rotate it that way. If you have a rotation on the Y axis, then one edge will come towards you, one will come away from you, you can turn it, and then uh, on the z-axis you can tilt, you know, one way or the other. So this has been, you know, by far one of the most powerful immediately felt and immediately seen tools that, you know, we can actually recenter visual space and a patient will notice it right away. Immediately their posture changes, immediately they start to cry because they're like, I can't believe after all these years that now I sense that I'm, I feel my feet on the ground, I feel more balanced. Those in the audience who have done, uh, you know, done vision therapy and use yoke prisms, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't work for everyone, but man, whoever it works for, it's completely life-changing. The point is of this not to be a permanent solution, but for them to sort of sense um, what normal space is, just to recalibrate their brain, and then over time, they just don't need the prisms anymore. So a patient will tell me, yeah, I don't need these. It's the same with or without, and I'm like, yes. So um, it's important to monitor these patients. And these are just a couple of studies um, really focused on the stroke population, but Dr. Uh, William Padula is like the godfather of uh, yoke prisms and visual midline shift. Um, so he has a bunch of studies in the literature, but basically he's published um, studies showing um, the effect of yoke prisms and how they can sort of normalize um, gait patterns and posture and, uh, and all those things. So it's, it's just amazing. So when someone tries on a yoke prism and they tell me I can feel my feet on the ground, it means that vision is now sending normal information to the, to the boardroom and proprioception is now saying, oh, okay, I know what normal is. Now I can feel the ground because I know where I am more. So it's, it's really remarkable. So color tints, um, you know, first, you know, talking about TBI, uh, it's well known in the literature that pupil dynamics are very abnormal with concussions. So, you, you know, with the sympathetic autonomic dysregulation, you get larger pupil, increased peak dilation velocity, reduced average constriction velocity, and pupil autonomic functions are closely related to cardiac autonomic functions. So, you know, our pupils are really the gateway to our autonomic system. And colored wavelengths affect pupil responses, and different wavelengths of light can influence heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is our ability to um, sort of uh, control our heart, uh, our heart rate, um, to different stresses. And different wavelengths of light can in influence this. So we can, as neurooptometrists, we can actually use different colored wavelengths of light to influence the autonomic system, which is very dysregulated. This uh, randomized placebo-controlled trial uh, recently published, and this was with adults with a concussion between four weeks to 18 months. They underwent six weeks of daily 30-minute sessions of either pulse blue light or amber light, and the sessions were within two hours of awakening and no later than 11 a.m. And the results were that with the blue light, there was better executive functioning, better sleep patterns, and greater thalamocortical um, functional connectivity. So basically, it was very, very, um, you know, it was shown that this light is good for healing. Um, and I mean, it's not surprising for me to see uh, results of light affecting healing. I mean, we, we all know like photobiomodulation, light, you know, causing a healing response, you know, with AMD and whatnot. I mean, there's, it's such a, um, you know, a vast topic now using light for healing. And it can also happen in the brain. So I want to show you something. I'm going to put this on the screen. So some of you might say, immediately, those sensitive people might say, okay, I feel really gross with this. Like, I feel my heart rate's increasing. I really don't like this. I want to look away. 
And then I'm going to flick to this one. And, you know, this is a different response. And with a concussed patient, I mean, colored wavelengths can really initiate a very powerful response either way. I've seen patients drop their shoulders and their breathing pattern changes with a tint. I mean, you can really influence their autonomic system and bring them more into a parasympathetic state versus a highly sympathetic state. Binasal occlusion is another um, uh, sort of tool that we have in our toolbox. It's pretty wild. It's just two pieces of tape. Um, from experience, uh, I use clear scotch tape, 0.5 centimeters wide, placed vertically on the nasal portion of each lens, and they can really dramatically, suddenly help with visual motion sensitivity, balance, scrolling on a screen, and even improve NPC in some cases. So the thought is that, you know, A, the tape dampens the peripheral stimulation, um, placed nasally it just dampens more the peripheral stimuli, and then that calms the brain down, it's not as confused, and processing um, is better. And this is confirmed with VEP studies, visually evoked potential studies. Um, also, the tape kind of dampens the nasal binocular fibers, so that might be less stress on the binocular system and hence a better, um, you know, perhaps convergence ability. So it's a very powerful, um, cheap um, tool that can be applied, and a patient will tell you right away if it works or doesn't. My rule of thumb, I tell this to patients, they kind of laugh when I say this. I say, I look for drama or I don't prescribe it. And I look for drama right away. So these patients are the best to tell you um, right away if they like something or don't. So you have to trial frame everything. Prescribing strategies for concussion and primary care, um, dry eye therapy, uh, single vision versus PALS. Um, when in doubt, you know, try single vision, try to push single vision if you can. So I often prescribe um, a single vision pair of distance and maybe a computer progressive um, for near. Um, there are patients who will adamantly argue with you, I don't want to get out of my progressives, don't make me. So I'm like, okay, fine, but I just have to warn you that they can affect what we call your VOR, which is your sort of gaze stable, your balance, um, your visual vestibular integration. So just be mindful of that. Base curves as flat as possible. Um, blue blocking AR, FL41 rose tint um, for screen or artificial lighting. Um, you know, trial frame everything. Gray photochromic tint. Um, near correction, don't underestimate um, a quarter of a diopter. Some people will think a, a half a diopter is too much. So a quarter of a diopter can be the golden ticket for them. Uh, prism to relieve stress at near. So things like 0.5 base in OU to trial frame, 0.5 base down OU. This can really help with some near tasks. Um, order ground in prism, not decentered. The effect of the prism is better, apparently, when you order ground in. Vertical compensatory prism, you have to trial frame, trial frame, trial frame, because otherwise, um, you know, if you assume, then the patient might say, I feel sick with this. Um, yoke prism is best saved for the trained OD um, to prescribe this. Screen intolerance, you know, I can't look at the computer. This is a common thing people say. There are screen factors, there are vision factors. So screen factors, you can have the blue light factor, um, sort of irritating the brain. Um, flicker, we'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, I'm talking a bit faster, hopefully not too fast, but for time's sake. Um, degree of motion, so are they looking at a video? Are they scrolling through Instagram? Like what are they, or do they get the same symptoms just like reading on a still screen? Um, the size of the screen, um, you know, a big desktop might be more symptomatic to them than like a small, a smaller screen, just because there could be more peripheral demand, more flicker perception, more light. Um, so the size of the screen can matter. And vision factors, Poor accommodation, stamina, and flexibility, convergence and stability, um, eye movement dysfunction, visual motion sensitivity that can affect this. Um, so, talking about flicker, um, critical flicker fusion frequency is the light frequency at which you no longer perceive it as flicker. And CFF in a sort of normal population is between 40 and 50 hertz. Our computers are standard, standard at 60 hertz, so there's a lot of buffer there. We don't perceive flicker on our screen typically. CFF is higher in mild TBI patients with motion and light sensitivity. So basically, um, a 60 hertz screen in their brain might feel like a strobe. So it's like, you know, imagine uh, reading through a strobe or scrolling through a strobe or watching video through a strobe. It's really, really disheartening. Um, Cortical excitability, excitability is correlated with glare discomfort. Um, LCD, and we're talking about the 60 hertz. So a 60 hertz monitor might be too flickery for the brain for these patients. So what I have suggested um, 
you know, to patients, which has worked in many cases, is a flicker-free monitor. There are flicker-free monitors on the market, either a high refresh rate like those gaming monitors um, and or no what we call pulse width modulation, which is the flicker of the backlight. So I've had patients say, oh my gosh, my tolerance has immediately improved. I don't feel nauseous on the screen. So flicker is just as important as blue light. So a blue light filter might not cut it alone. Um, vision rehab, we're not training the eye muscles, we're training the brain. So there are studies that show that you know, vision rehab improves um, signs and symptoms. Um, these are, you know, small scale studies and, you know, there are, these are, these studies are out there. Um, this was a randomized controlled pilot trial um, of oculomotor treatment and traumatic brain injury. This was published in an occupational therapy journal, not an optometry journal. And they did um, either cognitive based or what we call bottom up oculomotor therapy. Cognitive based is like visual search, um, eye movements, um, you know, involving reading. So you're using your cognitive function. Bottom up is more like, okay, follow this target or like move your head while you're looking at something. It's not really, you know, thinking tasks as much. And they found that bottom up therapy produced the greatest improvement, even though there was some improvement with top down. The conclusion they found was bottom up oculomotor therapy is a valuable approach for TBI, although top down can be useful. So they found um, changes in the in the probes that they um, tested with um, with uh, with oculomotor therapy. We all know the CITT study. Um, in summary, um, office based optometric vision therapy um, had with in conjunction with home reinforcement, produced the greatest um, improvement um, in CI compared to um, placebo or home-based therapy alone. And when you bring that to a concussion cohort, and this is a retrospective chart review, um, and this this population, you know, with a convergence problem, underwent the CITT protocol. Um, there were significant improvements in symptoms and signs. So you can apply the CITT protocol to a post-concussion population according to this uh, retrospective study. And this um, shows that, uh, so this review um, published recently, um, looking at NPC deficits and treatment following concussion, I'm just gonna read what uh, the red part of the conclusion. They, they found that there was a moderate level of evidence that patients have impaired NPC up to se several months post-concussion and a low level of evidence that impairments can be successfully treated with oculomotor therapy. So like low level of evidence that vision therapy works. I put a star at the bottom with some points. A, there's no standardized NPC method. Like, do you use an accommodative target or non-accommodative target? Is it, should it be to the nose or actually to the eyes? What if you have a bigger nose? I mean, there's really no standardized way of checking convergence. Number two, convergence requires more than the eyes. This is the biggest take home. So remember that boardroom is required for proper convergence. I can do all the vision therapy in the world, but if someone's neck is not functioning well, then I'm not gonna be successful in improving their convergence. Um, so you need multidisciplinary, larger, high quality studies involving not just vision, because the boardroom is not just vision, but all the departments help vision. And this is the take home, take home point. And vision rehabilitation um, following MTBI scoping review, um, again, published uh, last year recently. Conclusion, findings from the scoping review indicate that there are promising interventions for vision rehab that include the use of optical devices like prism glasses, vision or oculomotor therapy like targeted exercises to train eye movements and a combination of optical devices and vision therapy. Star, at the bottom, this is my star. There were no studies consisting of multidisciplinary intervention, only optometric. So concussion, you need um, a team, uh, a village to sort of just to help the visual system. I'm gonna repeat that again. Um, this study is very interesting. Going back to that, um, study that I mentioned in the beginning about gameplay versus practice, that you're more likely to get a concussion in a game than in practice. This study uh, published um, in 2015 by the University of Cincinnati compared their football teams, uh, those that were the team that was vision trained preseason and maintenance during the season versus uh, the team that was not vision trained. And they found that for the vision trained team between 2010, 2013, there were six concussions versus 35 concussions in the non-vision trained group between 2006 and 2009. Six concussions versus 35 concussions. And vision training really consisted of peripheral awareness training and processing speed. So, you know, basically the thought is if you can train someone to 
be more aware of their surroundings and process things quicker and read and react quicker, then you can handle um, a threat better. You can actually prepare for an injury or prepare to avoid an injury. Um, and so this is, you know, potentially showing the that, you know, vision training can potentially um, prevent a concussion. This is something that needs to be looked at further, but it's a very fascinating study. And this was recognized in the International Consensus Statement for Sport-Related Concussion. They, they recognized the study. So finally, what can we do, um, you know, as a rehabilitation approach, as a multidisciplinary rehabil rehabilitation approach to help these patients? Um, you know, each department has their role, each department has their way of doing things, but you can't operate in a vacuum. Vision, you know, optometrists, we cannot operate in a vacuum. We need other professions involved because the system is so, um, everything integrates with each other, so you can't just rely on one system only. I added uh, diet and neuroendocrine uh, function, so, you know, getting thyroid checked, um, you know, metabolic changes can occur after a con concussion, so you just have to make sure the whole body is checked. Um, and um, and this is sort of the model of uh, of care that we should you know we should all go by um, for treating these patients. So to specialize in neurooptometric rehab or collaborate with a rehab OD in your area, um, you know these are some great websites. COBD at the bottom they have a Canadian chapter, so uh, there is a separate website for the Canada chapter. But these are very good resources um, to collaborate with an OD or to actually look into specialty yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Blah. Well, we have a Thank few you. questions that have come in. Of course. The first question, at what point after the concussion do you typically see a patient or advise that therapy is initiated? So, um, you know, I had a patient, I've had a few patients actually, you know, I'm the first one they call. Um, saying, you know, I had a concussion yesterday and can I see you? And I'm like, Yes, you know, you can see me to check, you know, to make sure there's no like I, you know, ocular health effects, you know, their retina is intact, that whole thing, dilate your pupils, make sure everything's okay. But I would never do vision therapy on an acute case. Um, and some of my colleagues might argue with this, but, you know, usually I say, listen, go to your, you know, go to a, whether it's a concussion specialist, sports medicine physician, a physiotherapist, they need to treat your neck, they need to start you exercising, getting you in this sort of healing mode. Typically, I see patients um, at least, like I get referred at least when they're a month out, two weeks out at minimum, but I, usually a month out, I would actually start to see these patients. And, you know, many patients I've seen after like three years after their injury, they had no idea this was even a thing and that there was something that potentially can be done. Um, so the awareness of um, optometric help um, in this field has to still, um, you know, we have to still work on that. So, so usually I'll see them about um, a month or so after. Thank you. Great. Next question: Can you get a concussion from roller coaster rides? Yes, I had a patient who did that. So it's again the jostling, um, that's sort of that whiplash effect. So you're not necessarily hitting your head, but it's a really violent jostling of the head. So um, I actually lost him to follow up. He just never came back for some reason. I did an assessment. This was like about four years ago. Um, but he said, Yeah, I was on a roller coaster. And then I got off. I felt a bit off. Like I didn't really, you know, I thought it was just because of the ride. But then a few hours later, I started feeling dizzy, headache, light sensitive. And so it's a full on concussion. He had no history of prior concussion. Um, absolutely, roller coaster can be a, a risk factor. Same with go karts, right? So, yeah. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Next question If patient comes in for routine exam and they've been having PTVS symptoms, yep. how do you schedule a concussion appointment? Do you try by nasals or your prisms at the routine exam? Um, so at the routine exam, I wouldn't necessarily do yoga prisms because uh, you really have to understand um, how they're processing space. You need a really specialized assessment to actually do yoga prisms. You could try binasals um, immediately, and that would be safe to do in a primary care setting. Just, But again, <laughs> it's interesting because the binasal tape, I mean, I mentioned 0.5 centimeters wide, each side vertically placed. I've had patients say, yeah, I feel really, um, really sick with this and then I notice that one of their pieces of tape is slightly tilted to one side just even slightly so they'll notice if it's not perfect so you have to make it perfect I've learned from experience so 0.5 centimeters on one side 0.6 on the other the brain will notice this so um, yeah binasal occlusion feel free to try um, I would 
you know, tints, it can get a little tricky because tints can actually alter visual space. So, you know, it's safe to stick with a blue blocking lens or FL4, well, I mean, FL41 um, for office environments, you know, that kind of thing. But you have to trial frame because some people will immediately say they, they just don't like it. So, um, but yoke prisms, I'd probably reserve for the optometrist who specializes in it. So, if you see this patient in primary care practice, then you can contact um, a specialized, I guess, optometrist who uh, does vision rehab and, um, you know, you can sort of initiate the referral process with them. Great, thank you. Next question, is there evidence that blue light filter actually helps? So, um, yes. Uh, well, blue light filter actually assists with the CFF. So it actually helps with the flicker perception. So there's a relationship between blue light filter and, and the critical flicker fusion frequency. Um, on the reverse side though, like you don't really want a patient wearing a blue light filter all the time. And the reason why is because you need that blue light to get that alertness in their brain. So studies show that blue light actually helps the brain heal better, makes it more alert. Um, I've had patients, like what I will often do is I'll have patients purchase perhaps one of those like um, seasonal affective disorder lights um, that are full spectrum, whoops, full spectrum bright lamps that um, I say, okay, you know, in the winter, if you don't have access to like bright sunlight or, you know, or if you can go outside, that's great. But, you know, get that lamp, get exposed to that without the filter, and then you can wear the filter. Um, the blue light filter, to be honest, is re it really shines in those artificial light settings. So in an office setting, um, like at a Walmart, um, but when you're at home, you don't necessarily need it. So, um, you know, you definitely need the blue light to help with, you um, uh, with sort of uh, function of the brain to sort of help the healing along. So to cut that out is not necessarily the strategy for like permanent, um, you know, permanent wear. That's my answer for that. Okay, thank you. The mm -hmm. next question, how do you test for visual midline shift? So um, there are two schools of thought. Some people use both methods. Some people use one method or the other. Um, I tend to use both. Um, just to, you know, the more information you can get, the better. Um, so for example, I'll have a patient stand in the room. So there's a static way and a dynamic way. Static way is you have a patient stand um, in the room and you're you know, um, holding a pen, but you don't want to stand directly in front of them. You kind of stand at the side and you say, okay, tell me when the pen is directly in front of your nose. And, and they'll tell you stop. And then you see if it's, then you have to kind of lean over, you know, to avoid the sort of parallax um, and see sort of where it's aligned. And then you do it in the vertical direction as well. So I've had some patients say, um, yeah, my nose is here or my nose is, or now my, no my eyes are here. Or like when it's, when it's at eye level, they're like, yeah, here it's eye level. And so you know that there's sort of this weird shift in space that they're experiencing. The dynamic method is really walking them, watching them walk in the hallway. Are they are they leaning to one side? Are they favoring one side of the hallway? Are they veering to one side of the hallway? You know, one shoulder might be up. They might be leaning to one side. They might be arched in their back, or sort of you know their 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 heels might be striking the ground, or their toes might be more you know there might be more emphasis with their toes striking the ground. So that's a more dynamic way. Um, but you have to be again specially trained for that for that method for sure. Great, thank you. We have time for one more question. What are the main baseline tests in a standard eye exam that would be helpful for post-confession comparison? NPC, I think, is huge. Um, you know, certainly smooth pursuits, you know, uh, you know, NBC is a big one, though, you know, because I, I actually saw a kid, uh, t a 10-year-old kid, and I had, I just happened to see him for a routine eye exam um, the year before, and his NPC was to the nose, no problem. And then his mom said, yeah, he had a concussion a month ago. They called me a year later. He came in, and his NPC was 20 centimeters. I know that that's a change, and that's an obvious post-concussion change. Um, even though if you saw the kid initially and he had a 20 centimeter NPC, I mean, that's pretty remote, but that was a big difference. Um, even if it was um, a change of like five, 10 centimeters, I mean, that's significant. So NPC, I think, is huge for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, but again, eye movement testing, uh, pupil evaluation maybe. Um, but yeah, NPC is the first thing that comes to mind. And a combination okay. amplitude, sorry, in the non-presbios, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. So thank at you. this time, I would like to thank you, Dr. Blanc, for your very insightful presentation.